The Summer I Met David, Part 3, by the lovely Freya. I screamed so loud that I felt myself vibrate with it slice through the silence. I still don't know who it belonged to. More panicked voices joined in before my father sped away from the mouth of the forest, heading toward town. I remember that drive being the most frightening of my life. Not because David was somewhere behind us, or because I thought he might follow us, but because of the erratic way the station wagon zigged and zagged on the empty country road. I couldn't think of anything other than the question of what might happen to our souls if we were to die in that moment. Would David capture them? Hide them away in some den where we would be at his mercy for the rest of eternity? Would our Heavenly Father search for us if he did? I tried not to think about it. My father did 80 the whole way there, never slowing down until we were on Maple Road. It was a familiar stretch of pavement adjacent to our church, dotted with small middle-class homes, armed with manicured lawns and flawless gardens. The tires squealed, staining the cement with black rubber as we came to a screeching halt. My father's eyes were wide and frantic as he turned around, staring at a lot of us. Stay right here, he commanded, before jumping out of the car and running up the cement steps to the small blue home that we'd parked in front of. Confusion swept over me. Aside from our church that peeked over the tops of the trees, I didn't recognize anything. Where are we? I asked, looking around at the obtuned face of my family members. Joe was still wailing. Snot was running down his face, his cheek and forehead turned bright red. Mom was trying to calm him down, but nothing was working. Father Brown's house, Jack answered from the back. His voice was hoarse and defeated. I glanced back to him curiously. Father Brown taught at our church. We went every week and mom went to church group twice a week. I wanted to know why we'd chosen to come to Father Brown's house. Despite the fact that he was our priest, we never saw him outside of church. He wasn't like any of my dad's friends who came by on the weekend to play cards. He was practically a stranger. But another question was prodding at my small mind, one I couldn't possibly ignore. How do you know? I asked, as I watched my father ring the doorbell time and time again. We went to his house for dinner once, when you were really little. It was before Joey was born. You were too little to remember. Jack explained as he leaned against the seat. His head was resting on the soft cushion. He looked exhausted. Great bags perched just below his eyes. The color had gone away from his cheeks, but his eyes were open, seemingly without any difficulty. I had my doubts that he would ever sleep again. The door swung open, pulling my attention from my brother and back to my dad. Out stepped a very disheveled looking Father Brown, the two men spoke to one another, but even in the silence of the car, I couldn't hear what was being said. It seemed like forever before my father turned around and waved us toward himself. Father Brown's eyes settled on each of us separately as we walked up the sidewalk. Pain washed over his features and he made a small noise of pity. Come on inside, guys. Jasmine, Johnny, I don't have any clothes that'll fit you, but you can wear one of my t-shirts for the night, and we'll see about getting your clothes washed, he informed us. Walking into the house made me feel light. There was a certain peace, a calm sort of serenity that settled over the home. It was a welcome change from the thick, heavy feeling at our own home. Father Brown allowed us to shower. You fed us, you gave us new clothes, and washed those sword with vomit and urine. We were sent to bed at midnight. I didn't think it was possible that I would sleep, but it was proven wrong in mere minutes. I sank into sweet oblivion while I curled up in Jack's arms, my face pressed into his chest. For the first time in weeks, I felt safe. The sun was just touching the horizon when I woke up. The green numbers on the clock across the room proclaimed it to be just after 5am. My throat was on fire. I didn't realise until just then that I hadn't drank any water at all that day, and I was beginning to feel the repercussions. I laid entirely still as I toyed with the idea of getting up. I was warm and comfortable, and wearing only the t-shirt Father Brown had given me. While massive and fitting more like a dress, it still meant I was going to be cold the second I stood up. I sucked in a deep breath, deciding it was best that I'd just stand up and do it. If I didn't get something to drink, I'd never be able to get back to sleep. Just as I began to lift Jack's arm up off me, a voice from the other room penetrated the silence. Ghosts are entirely fictional. They simply don't exist. When you're so parsed with this world, you cross over immediately. God doesn't allow souls to slip through the cracks, Father Brown said, his voice sounding entirely certain. You don't understand, my father interjected. 
You didn't see what- Hold on, hold on. Father Brown cut him off. I'm not invalidating your experiences here, Joshua. What I'm telling you is that it is absolutely not a ghost. Now, while ghosts don't exist, demons are very, very real. My heart leapt. Had I made friends with a demon? Was that possible? Did that mean I was bad? Would I go to hell for talking to him? Would God be angry with me for not recognizing him for what he was? My stomach churned as I imagined all the things demons were supposed to do to good Christian families. I'd heard the stories in church. I didn't understand them entirely, but I knew they found joy in tormenting those that followed the word of the Lord. What can we do? My mother asked. An exorcism, the priest answered. Unfortunately, it isn't as easy as me just coming in and reciting the rite. He informed my parents. There is a very strict set of rules. There will have to be an investigation. We'll have to collect- What? Came a shout from behind me. I screamed. Joey began to cry. Jack jumped up from his place, using his body to shield as many of us as he could. Jasmine brought a demon to our house? Johnny snarled. He glared down to me. Good job, idiot. My features crumpled. I hadn't been the only one listening. Now everyone would know that I was to blame. Jack would hate me the same way Jim and Johnny did. Tears streamed down my face and I curled into myself. I'm sorry, I cried. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. I'd expected angry words from my oldest brother. I'd expected him to turn on me. Instead, he kicked Johnny, making him cry out in pain. Stop being mean to her, Jack snarled. It's not as if any of us knew any better either. I stared up to Jack, warmth spreading through my chest as I realized I hadn't made him into an enemy as well. Enough, my father roared. Go back to bed. Immediately, I flattened myself down onto the ground, afraid of what might be done if we didn't listen. Father Brown and Dad went somewhere else, probably to finish the discussion, while my mother picked up Joey and rocked him in the chair. The whole while, she glared at Johnny and I, likely blaming the two of us for having woken the baby. I never got back to sleep that night. The next morning, Father Brown offered to do the farm chores for us. My dad agreed that the boy shouldn't be there, but he was sure to insist that he would accompany the father. For two days we stayed, my father absolutely adamant that no one but he and my mother were allowed to leave the safety of the home. On the third day, everything changed. My mother and father spent every waking hour away from Father Brown's house. Despite our many prying questions, they refused to tell any of us where they were going. School started that Monday, day six into our stay with the father. Mom and dad were gone, something that had become very normal for us. My two older brothers and I had gotten dressed and packed lunches, but Father Brown informed us that we wouldn't be attending school that week. We'd go the following Monday instead. It should have been the most exciting news ever, but it felt wrong. It made me feel sick. It made the whole situation seem worse. Not only had David driven us from our home, but he'd put a stop to our daily activities. The boys had stopped helping Dad with chores. Instead, he and Father Brown did it. Mom and I didn't clean the house anymore. Now we weren't even going to school. Everything was wrong. I hated it. None of us voiced our concerns. Instead, we helped Father Brown with the chores. We watched television, we cared for Joey, we played cards and games, and we kept off fighting to a minimum. For days this went on. Until Thursday. We woke up to find our parents still home sitting at the table, sipping coffee with the priest as though it was entirely normal. I threw myself at both of them, showering them with love and affection. Mom was smiling, Dad seemed happy. I didn't know the reason behind their joy, but I remember feeling as though everything was going to be okay. We were instructed to pack our things and get the car. Father Brown gave us each a hug or a handshake, and told us we were always welcome back if ever we needed it. I remember being sad that we were leaving, but grateful at the same time. I missed my home. And while I didn't plan on ever sleeping in my room on my own again, I much prefer curling up beside Jack, I did want to go back. When we pulled up to the home, there was a sleek red Geo Metro waiting for us. My siblings and I tossed questioning gazes to it, but mom and dad didn't seem concerned. Dad parked, got out, and shook hands with a very tall, very wide man. He was dressed in black slacks and a green t-shirt. Red hair clung on his scalp and chin. Over his shoulder, he slung a green backpack with an odd white swirly symbol on it. He and Dad spoke for what seemed like forever, before Dad mentioned for us to get out. 
Feels heavy here. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like it. A light accent played along the words the new man spoke. It had a bouncy, rolling lilt to it, reminding me of leprechauns. It took me an embarrassingly long time to realize he was Irish. Can you do anything about it? My dad asked. His voice trembled with concern. He was practically wringing his hands in front of himself. I looked behind me to find the rest of my family. They shifted uncomfortably, eyes darting around the farm as though they expected David to walk out of the house or barn at any moment. My mother clutched Joey to her chest, despite his protests and flailing arms. She positively refused to put him down, which only served to piss him off. He used tiny hands to push away from her, shouting something about being a big boy and needing to walk. Oh, absolutely, the man answered, drawing my attention away from my brother. I watched the tension melt away from my father's shoulders as he exhaled with sudden relief. Why don't you show me inside and we'll get started? The man asked, before tossing a gaze our way. With a wide, toothy grin, he introduced himself as Brett and extended a hand to me. Jack pulled me closer to himself, although I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out why. Walking up to the old wooden porch had my skin crawling. The house looked awful. Once proud and pristine, almost every window was cracked. The paint on the siding had begun to chip. The plants my mother worked so hard on had withered and died. Dad opened the door and we stepped inside. Goosebumps rose along my arms. The air was thick, hot, and heavy. It was hard to breathe. I suddenly felt as though ants were crawling along my skin. I reached up, taking Jack's hand in my own, and molding against him. It felt so wrong here. Suddenly, I couldn't get the image of David's eyeless face from my mind. The man placed his bag on the table and began to pull out a small white pamphlet, as well as a glass bowl and four bottles of water. Pathetic little sticky notes labelled them as holy water. I hadn't known it was wrong then, but the older members of my family did. I watched as disbelief washed over my parents' faces. Jack actually laughed, a terrible, bitter sort of noise that sent a shiver down my spine. I craned my head upwards and opened my mouth to ask what was funny, or perhaps not funny. Before I could get a single syllable out, static erupted into the silence. I jumped. Jack pulled me up into his arms. Johnny and Jim screamed. Making love until the break of dawn. H-Town's knocking boots blared through the radio. Static again. And I, I will always love you. Static. There it is. The radio whined a loud, terrible screeching noise and began to shake. It vibrated down the counter until it slid off, stretching the cord tight and dangling as it blared the words to various songs. I screamed and buried my face in Jack's shoulder. Brett laughed. It's okay, dear, he assured me. You can't let it bother you. It didn't make any sense to me. Why wasn't Brett terrified? Why didn't he jump like Johnny did or cry like Jack did? I sniffed away tears and nodded, but try as I might, I couldn't make my body stop trembling. I didn't want to see David again, and I had a feeling that that was exactly what was about to happen. I peeled myself away from Jack's chest, craning my neck so I could watch Brett, while still managing to stay in my brother's arms. Try your little fist while you can, Brett taunted. He pulled the plug away from the outlet and allowed the radio to drop to the ground. With a smug sort of smile and a few more reassuring words, he opened a bottle of holy water. Brett's hand hovered over the bowl. He tilted the bottle. Not a single drop poured from the open mouth before it was knocked from his hand. Holy water rained down upon the room, splattering the walls and soaking the floor. The bottle rolled, stopping only when it hit the far wall. It made a small gurgling noise as the liquid poured out onto the already destroyed wooden flooring. Brett's eyes narrowed. He seemed genuinely confused for several long seconds before he reached for a second bottle. SLAM! All four bottles on the table were suddenly careening across the room. They hit windows, they slammed against cabinets. One cracked the glass of the oven. Brett swallowed hard, eyes wide with unmistakable fear. He pulled one final bottle from the backpack. With a shaky hand, he unscrewed the top, his eyes darting around him nervously. I held my breath, waiting for David to send it hurdling across the room. Brett poured the water. It sloshed against the glass sides of the bowl. With bated breath, we watched in horror and fascination as he lifted the pamphlet up off the counter and opened to the first page. He spoke in a quivering voice, without any conviction, much the way Johnny spoke to mom and dad when he was lying. Brett dipped his fingers in the holy water and allowed it to drip onto the floor. 
most glorious prince of the heavenly armies, Saint Michael the Archangel. A small, bitter patter sliced through the silence. My fist tightened against Jack's shirt as I spun around, searching for the noise. Joey's favorite blue ball bounced into the room. We watched in utter silence and awe as it rolled to a stop at my mother's feet. Joey squirmed to get free, shouting about his ball. My mother held him tightly and moved away from it as though it might bite her. Jack kicked the ball away from us. It spun and fled down the hallway. It rolled back, only to stop at my mother's feet for a second time. My heart was thrumming so quickly I thought it might actually leap from my chest. My hands were wet with sweat, tears were streaming down my cheeks. Brett licked his lips, the pamphlet shook in his hand. He began the prayer over, getting no further when a slow creak interrupted him. With wide eyes, I watched the cupboard just above my father's head open. He leapt away. Massive hands grabbed the shoulders of both my brothers and pulled them back away from it. There was no warning. No puff of smoke like in the movies. No ominous music. It just happened. It was like an explosion. Streaks of white and blue and pink and green careened to the ground. An air splitting crash shook me to the very core. Before I could process what had actually happened, the shattered glass of every plate, bowl, dish and cup my mother owned was splayed at our feet. Every cabinet was open and emptied. Joe was screaming. I didn't realize until Jack placed the hand on my back that I was too. My mother had burst into tears. My father suggested we leave. Brett insisted that he could do this and started the prayer over again. The burners turned on. I could feel the heat from where I was. A bright light sparked to life before the cracked glass of the oven. At first I thought there was some sort of fire inside, but as it grew brighter, I recognized the shape as that of the heating coil inside of it. BANG! The coil exploded. My mother shrieked. She turned to dart out the door. Something touched my foot. At first I thought it was Jack, but... It was too cold. And it was wet. I looked down to find nothing at all. But I felt the invisible fingers tighten around my ankle. I shrieked. An unseen force jerked me on my brother's arms. I hit the ground with all the force of a freight train. White bursts of light exploded into my vision. My eyes rolled aimlessly in my head as I tried to get my bearing again. What the fuck happened? My dad shouted. Something pulled her! Jack shouted back. My dad's eyes widened. He leapt forward, my name on his lips. Heavy footfalls exploded just inches away from my feet. And terrifyingly enough, I found myself being dragged. My father gave chase, but he wasn't nearly as fast. Dad! I shouted. Jack! I slid along the hardware floor, heading for the stairs. My heart sank. In that moment, I knew I was going to die. There was absolutely no doubt about it. David had me now. And he was going to kill me. I clawed the ground, leaving long claw marks along the soft wood. I made a desperate grab for anything at all as I flailed and kicked, trying my best to get away. Heavy sobs tore through my body. I managed to stop myself as I latched onto the doorframe. My father was just feet from me. My heart was racing. Tears streamed down my face. I feared the worst. That they wouldn't get to me in time. That David would pull me upstairs, lock me behind a door. Dad! I shrieked again. Brett lunged forward, throwing the entirety of the bottle at me. Cold water splashed against my skin, soaking me to the bone, and stunning me enough to cause me to let go of the wall. Pain bloomed along my ankle where David had grabbed me. I wailed in agony. It felt as though my leg had caught fire. I thrashed, my hands going to it immediately as my nails dug into the flesh around it. An angry half-growl, half-hiss shook the very foundation of the home. Jack grabbed my arm and pulled me up. I clung to him, wrapping arms and legs around him as tightly as I could. I want to leave, I shouted. I want to leave! Bang! All at once, the doors and windows slammed shut. There was no more menacing and terrifying a sound than the simultaneous clicks of a dozen locks. I buried my face in Jack's shoulder and cried. David had no intention upon letting us leave. Don't let him take me again, Jack. Don't let him take me! I pleaded through heavy sobs. Jack rubbed my back. His lips touched my forehead. You aren't going anywhere, he swore. The faucet turned on. Static filled the air. My eyes landed on the now unplugged radio that lay on the ground beside Brett. Jasmine. Jasmine. Jazzy. Jasmine. Jasmine! The familiar voice oozed from the static. Jasmine. 
called my name wickedly. My father's heavy boot crashed down upon the radio. It shattered, but the static in my name never stopped. Instead, it became distorted and drawn out. Somehow, I made it so much worse. Panic was taking over. Joey and I wailed. Johnny had curled up, shaking in the corner as he sobbed. Jim was clinging to my mother, his face buried in her shoulder. Even my father was crying. Ding, 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 ding. The doorbell rang again and again. The faucet turned itself on and off. Jack peeled me away from himself. I clawed at him, grabbing handfuls of his plaid shirt. No, no, no! I shouted desperately. I want to stay with you! Despite my sobs and protests, he handed me over to my father. Hold her! He shouted. Dad's muscular arms wrapped around me. Jack pulled the shirt up over his head, dashed to the largest of the kitchen windows, and wrapped his hand with it. He drew an arm back, and with an ear-splitting crash, the glass shattered around him. With curses on his lip, he was quick to knock out any remaining glass. Click. The windows and doors unlocked. Creak. The door swung open. Jim ran toward it, but just as he stepped through the threshold, my mother pulled him back. The door slammed shut and locked again. A laugh trickled through the broken radio. Almost! It teased. I couldn't breathe. Every door in the house swung open and slammed shut. I could hear them from upstairs, from the basement, down the hall. We were surrounded by the sound. Jack knocked the screen out and began to wriggle his way out the window. I heard the crunch of his feet against gravel, and then he called out. Get out here! My mother shoved Joey into Jack's arms first, then I slid through to the outside. I'd never been so happy to see the outdoors in my life. Johnny and Jim were next, last were my parents and Brett. Brett tore through the driveway, leapt into his car, and peeled away without ever looking back. Jack whispered a few mumbled curses under his breath as we rushed to our own car. My father sped away. He swore to us in that moment that we'd stay with the father until we could get a real priest in to exercise the home. Do we have to go back? Jim demanded. Can't we just sell it and leave? He asked. There was a long pause. Who's gonna buy a haunted house? Johnny asked. Another long pause settled over us as the reality of the situation set in. We were fucked. Entirely and completely fucked. We had no means of finding a new place to live. We could only invade Father Brown's home for so long. We couldn't sell, because who would buy? We had no money to buy or rent something else. We were stuck. What if it's not the house that's haunted? Jim asked, shattering the somber silence that had settled over us. He stared over to me. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. Jack hit Jim, but the damage had been done. What if, what if I was haunted? I couldn't get that thought out of my mind. The rest of the drive to the house passed in a haze. Once there, we practically ran into poor Father Brown's home, never bothering to knock. Luckily enough, he didn't seem upset about it. Together, through sobs, we recounted the terrifying events of the day. Father Brown asked to see my ankle. The perfect shade of a handprint had been burned into my skin. It wasn't blistered, although it was a bright shade of red and peeling along the sides. He made small noises of discontent and mumbled something about being first degree. He turned it this way and that, his eyes looking more worried the longer he stared at it. Finally, he looked up to me, a wide, fake smile plastered upon his lips. It was the same sort of smile Jack had worn the night Johnny had broken his arm. You'll be okay, Jazzy. Why don't we spread some aloe on that? You'll heal up, he swore. I didn't argue. I just followed him into the bathroom, where he asked me to sit on the side of the bathtub. I sat down, the cold porcelain biting into my skin and making me squirm. Father Brown swung the medicine cabinet open. The mirror glided past him. Had I not looked up at that very moment, I might have missed it. Father Brown's kind smile and soft eyes stared back at me from the mirror. And then, suddenly, it was nowhere to be seen. Replaced with David's empty eyes and wicked smile, my hands shook. My breath caught my throat, my stomach churned, I jumped to my feet and tore through the hall. Rapid footfalls followed me, a hand slammed down upon my shoulder and tightened, pulling me to a halt. Dad! I shrieked. Jasmine! 
Father Brown said, spinning me around, blue eyes searching my own green. Jasmine, what's wrong? He demanded. Jasmine. Father Brown's voice was low, and he made himself as small as possible. Normally I would have found it calming. His soft tones and kind eyes should have made the world seem safe again. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the image of empty eye sockets staring back at me from the mirror.